Yes, okay. sure. All right. So welcome to the second of the summer school webinars um, uh, for um, Euro NMD in collaboration with the Rare Neurological Disorders European Reference Network and the Academy of Neurology, um, uh, European Academy of Neurology. Uh, today's webinar is about the validation of MRI as a biomarker in clinical trials. Emin Khan from uh, uh, Leiden University is going to navigate us through this team. We uh, know that currently this is one of the more important biomarkers that has been used and is going to be increasingly used probably in the clinical trials uh, in the future. And uh, it has uh, brought a new dimension for not only the diagnosis, but probably for the monitoring also of therapies. And uh, it would be uh, obviously uh, a fundamental point for these summer school webinars. Uh, Ermin Khan uh, works in Leiden, as I said, where she uh, has important role in the uh, uh, MRI um, section of the for neuromuscular diseases. And I thank her very much for agreeing to participate in the webinar and uh, give her the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I see. Lots of familiar names among the, the attendees, but also some unfamiliar names, so that's really nice. Um, so again, thank you for the, for the introduction and also for the invitation. Uh, I've given this um, lecture before in the summer school of TUTNMD uh, and the ERN, but I've updated it, of course, with, I tried to update it as much as possible with some recent data, but as uh, was already mentioned, there are a lot of MRI studies appearing, so I already um, say sorry if I did not include your favorite study uh, in the talk, but you can send it to me later and then maybe next time I will. So as an outline of my talk today, I'll first give you some background on MRI. I know that there are several people in this webinar who already know a lot about MRI, but also to make sure that the people who don't kind of know that what we're talking about. Um, I will explain why we need quantitative MRI and why the, the appearance of quantitative MRI has actually enabled a lot of the, the studies and, and, and where we are right now in the development of MR as, a, as an uh, outcome measure. I will explain the relation of the things that we have found to disease progression and to muscle function uh, and daily living. Uh, I will shortly go into trial readiness to the things that we have already done uh, and, and a lot of people have already done. And then uh, a little bit about the future, how we go from individual scientific studies to accepted outcome measures, because that is something that I really learned over the past decade um, that is much more difficult than I thought. So first, a little bit of history. I always like to include this picture, uh, which uh, is, is from the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. I must confess, I don't really know. Uh, but what you see here is a prototype uh, 0 0.15 Tesla scanner from Philips on your left, which uh, doesn't look at all like a scanner uh, uh, today, at least that's because we, we dress it up a lot more nicely. Um, but you can also see the first brain scan of a patient in the LUMC in 1981. Um, and if we would make a scan like this today, we would say the scan has big, it's just not successful. But back then we were really happy that we could look uh, into the brain. Uh, and this is actually back here. I put like a, a virtual background, but if you would look behind me, you would see uh, almost see the door to our seven Tesla MRI scanner, uh, which is also still from Philips. Um, and this is a high resolution brain scan we made here at the seven Tesla in 2015. Uh, and I guess the difference between what you saw before is obvious. Um, these are the only two brain images I'll show today. So for the rest, I promise that I will fully focus uh, on muscle. So what is MRI? So MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. And what we do with MRI is that we image protons. So if we can imagine some of the protons here, I just made a, a cartoon here uh, of the protons on top of, an, uh, of a leg, a muscular dystrophy patient leg actually. Uh, and if we would then put these protons into an external magnetic field, what would happen is that they would align uh, to this external magnetic field with uh, uh, a proportion of the protons aligning parallel and another proportion aligning anti-parallel to the field. What we do then uh, is we can send a radio wave into, into these protons and what, they, what happens is that they tilt, right? They, they switch position. Then we switch off 
the, uh, the radio waves and then they fall back to their original position. And when they fall back to their original position, they send out radio waves to send out energy actually. And this energy we can pick up with a local receiver. And this is the basis of MRI basically. It's a very simplistic way of saying it. So I know that the MR physicists in the audience right now will probably cringe a little bit, but this is the very simple, very simple way of explaining MRI. So what do we need then? I told you in the beginning, we need a magnet, right? So this is a large three Tesla scanner and three Tesla is a unit for, uh, uh, for magnetic field, basically for the strength of the magnetic field. And three Tesla, as you see here, is about 52,000 times the earth magnetic field. So this is a scanner. Then we also need the antenna to receive the signal. As I said, once we've given uh, uh, some energy into the protons, they fall back, they emit energy when they fall back, and we need an antenna to, to pick up this signal. This signal, however, is not very strong. So we need this antenna to be as close to the tissue of interest as possible. So in this case, I said I wouldn't show any brain images anymore. That was true, but this is a brain coil, actually a head coil. So you put your head in. Um, what we would do for skeletal muscle is that we have more like a, um, a blanket type of coil that you put on top uh, of legs or arms or wherever the muscles that you want to image. The scanner also makes quite a bit of noise. Those of you that have been into an MRI scanner will know this, and we need to protect the ears against this noise. So you also need headphones against the noise. And there's also a microphone attached to these headphones. So you can actually talk to the operator who's usually outside of the, uh, outside of the MR room. Right, so in summary, what do we do with MRI? We image protons. So we put a person into the scanner, there are, uh, the, the, the protons in the body emit signal, a proton signal, and from this signal we can do fancy mathematical uh, tricks and we obtain an image. So what do we see on such an image? In this case, a muscle image. So this, what you see here, is a transfer slice through the upper leg. And what we see is the bone in the middle, right? You have one bone, one large bone in your upper leg, where the bone itself is black and the white here is bone marrow fat. So that's bright in this image. This is a T1 weighted image, as you would say it. Then we see some blood vessels. We see all kinds of different muscles. So the quadriceps here at the front and the hamstrings at the back. And we see the subcutaneous fat, which is surrounding the leg basically. So what are the advantages of magnetic resonance imaging? Well, I told you that we would send in radio waves. Well, these radio waves do not contain ionizing radiation, right? So we consider it a non-invasive technique because there's no ionizing radiation. Um, and it has a very high spatial resolution. As you could saw, see in the previous image, we could depict all the different muscles and we could even see the borders between the muscles. So you have a very high spatial resolution, as you would say. it. There's a large imaging plane, like if you compare it to a muscle biopsy where you take a very tiny sample from one muscle, here we can look at pretty much all the muscles in the body if you would want to. It's less dependent on motivation compared to functional tests, for instance, right? So if you would ask somebody to walk, as is a common outcome measure in, in, in muscular dystrophy trials, is for walk for six minutes, especially in children, that's really dependent on motivation. I would not say an MRI is not dependent on motivation because if you do not want to lie still, because that's a very important um, aspect of, of an MRI is that you, because the, the signal is so low, you have to lie still for extended periods of time. If you do not want to lie still, the subject doesn't want to lie still, you would not get, would not get a good image. But yeah, as long as you lie still, it's not dependent on motivation. We can also do quantitative assessments. Right? So it's much more objective compared to a qualitative score of muscle force, for instance, or something else. And another big uh, um, advantage, which I unfortunately will not have time to go into today, is that you can get multiple contrasts in one imaging session. And what do I mean with multiple contrasts in one imaging sessions, session? Well, that means that within one imaging session of typically a half an hour to an hour, we can get measurements of muscle or cellular size, we can look at fatty replacement. We can look at edema or inflammation, or at least get measures for edema and inflammation. We can look at cellular damage. And yeah, we hope that we can look at fibrosis, but that is still something that is um, under development. So why are all these contrasts now so important? 
Well, that's because the disease cascade in neuromuscular disease actually has a lot of these aspects that I just mentioned involved in it. So if you would have a healthy muscle, like all of us hopefully have, we exercise or we do something for which we get muscle damage, then from the healthy muscle, we get muscle damage, you get inflammation, oh, that's what I see, you get inflammation and regeneration uh, and transient collagen deposition. But then in a healthy muscle, this is a circle, right? So the, the, the muscle repairs and you have a healthy muscle again. So what happens in muscle disease? In muscle disease, one of the, at least the hypothetical pathways is that you get a persistent inflammation, right? And if you remember the previous slide, inflammation is something that we could look at. Due to this persistent inflammation, you get fibrosis, fatty replacement, and changes in fiber size. This will all result in less muscle recovery and due to this, this uh, reduced muscle recovery, you get a loss of muscle fibers and muscle function. So indeed, if we look uh, on histology, on histological slides from muscle biopsies, what you see is changes in muscle and fiber size. You can see edema and inflammation. You can see necrosis. You can see fat replacement. And you can see scar tissue. And I've included uh, two imaging, two histological slides here, where here you see the fat replacement. You can also see that, no, sorry, I should have included a, a healthy sample, I now realize. But normally in a muscle fiber, you can see that it has all sharp edges. Basically in here, it's all rounded. You can see that the fibers are not all of the same size. And here on this uh, biopsy sample, you can see some fibrosis and edema and inflammation. So, if you come back then to the contrast that I just mentioned uh, and the role for magnetic resonance imaging, uh, you can see that actually many of the aspects that are mentioned here in the disease cascade can be measured. Again, in the interest of time, I will only focus here on fat replacement and on muscle size, also because these are the techniques or these are the, the, the aspects that have been looked at the most. Um, uh, but if you want to know more and look into the literature, there's actually a lot of other uh, imaging techniques being used in neuromuscular disease. So many of the techniques that I will mention today are the Dixon technique or fat water imaging uh, and, uh, and also proton MRS. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the step toward to quantitative MRI has actually enabled us to do a lot of the correlations and associations that I will show later on. But what is the difference between, what, what do I actually mean with quantitative MRI? So in conventional MRI, as we would call it, we would get a T1 weighted image, which is, um, which is shown here of a patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. What we now do with quantitative imaging, when we use the Dixon technique at least, is that we obtain a fat image and a water image of exactly the same tissue. And you do this within one sequence. So there are not two separate acquisitions. You do this in one sequence. And I will not explain why. There are enough reviews about it. Uh, and it, it, yeah, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. So the main thing is that we obtain a fat image, we obtain a, a water image, and, we, uh, uh, and with these two images, we can obtain the fat fraction of a specific region of interest. So one of the first things that, that I did when I started working in Leiden, uh, which is my first PhD student, is to actually compare a qualitative scoring, as was still conventional, about yeah, a long time ago, but it is still being done a lot because it's a lot faster also to, to actually look at images like this, uh, is to look at the, the qualitative scoring that was done where you basically score a muscle with a one, which is a normal muscle, a two, uh, fatty streak, so that's about less than 15% fat, three, mild changes, which is less than 30% fat, four is moderate changes, which is between 30 and 60% fat, and five is severe changes. So we asked two of our radiologists to score these images on this five point scale. And then we made from the same region of interest, we made Dixon images, and then we compared their scoring to uh, the fat fraction. So you can see here, for instance, that this muscle was semi-quantitatively scored as a two. So that would mean less than 15% fat, where indeed the quantitative uh, uh, Dixon images showed that, it had, that this muscle had 6% fat. This muscle, however, was scored as a five, so severe changes over 60% fat. Well, actually, if we quantified it, it only showed 26% of fat. So you can imagine if you looked at these images that uh, when we sum all these, the, these results together, that a normal muscle will be also normal on a quantitative fat percentage score. But you can see that with even though it, 
it's correlated, right? So a more severe muscle on the qualitative scoring is also more severely affected on the quantitative aspect. But you can also see that the range uh, at the qualitative scoring, uh, uh, sorry, the range in fat fraction in a score of five is huge, right? And then if you want to test a therapy where there's only a couple of percent change in fat fraction per year, a scoring of one to five will not get you there. It will never be sensitive enough to score the effects of such a therapy. I put the original reference here from Beatrice Walker, which was my first uh, PhD student. And I know that many, many, many other people have shown this. So it was not our radiologists that weren't very good at scoring. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's a general uh, uh, finding. Um, and I did not put all the references here. So I'm sorry if you miss your, your name here. Um, so what does this tell us again? So I've, I've added uh, an image here of FSHD, so fascioscapular humeral dystrophy, uh, and an image of a Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient, and where previously we could only score these images on a scale of one to five or one to four, there are different scales out there. We can now actually put numbers on here, right? So this muscle has 8% fat, this muscle has 80% fat, this muscle has 30% fat. Another thing that stands out on this image, at least for me, is that it's very different, right? It's not the case that in every single neuromuscular disease, the same muscles are affected. Here, the rectus femoris has 30% fat. I didn't put a number here, but here in FSHD is actually affected less. The difference is very apparent here at the hamstring. So at the back of the leg, where this whole posterior compartment in this FSHD patient is almost completely gone, while in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient, there's still quite a bit of muscle left. While in contrary, here at the front, this Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient has 65% fat, while the muscle here, uh, the, the fascis lateralis, is preserved um, almost completely in the FSHD patient. So this is something that we'll come back to later, but the, the muscles that are affected differ quite a bit between the, the different diseases, and we don't know why. So we've shown now that we can quantitatively measure the fat in a single muscle. That's all really nice, but if this fat fraction does not correlate to function, it doesn't serve a good purpose as a biomarker, right? Because in the end for the patient, what is most important is daily life function. So a biomarker needs to at least be related to function somehow. So I've lined out uh, a number of different studies. So this again is an example from our own lab from Beatrice Wokke, uh, where we uh, imaged, <coughs> excuse me, a number of different boys with Duchenne. So this is not the same boy uh, aging over time. These are all different patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where this boy is the youngest, a five-year-old, and this is uh, a 15 or 16-year-old, if I remember correctly. And what you can see that over time, the fat fraction increases. And you see that because the muscles are becoming more and more white, right? So it's more and more resembling the subcutaneous fat, which is outlined uh, uh, on the outside. So what you can also see, because there's a Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient, is there, that there's typical hypertrophy. So a bigger muscles at the back compared to the front. Uh, and that is actually also preserved until quite late. So... Uh, the increase in fat with disease progression and the increase in fat with, with age uh, is not uh, uh, particular to Duchenne, of course. There are many different muscle diseases, and many of them are progressive, slowly or fast progressive. This is an example in LGMD2I, for instance, where these are patients of, uh, of different ages or different disease stages. It's not really stated in the paper, at least not in the figure caption, where uh, in this patient number, uh, patient A, there's hardly any fat replacement, while in patient E, there is a lot of fat replacement, right? And here it also seems in LGMD2I here, it also seems to start in the hamstrings uh, more compared to the frontal compartment. Uh, in the study by the, the group in Nijmegen, you can see that in uh, myotonic dystrophy type one, the fat fraction of the muscles is actually uh, correlated to a clinical score. So the MIR score is a clinical score in myotonic dystrophy. And you can see that patients that have a higher MIR score, so are doing worse basically, also have a higher general fat fraction. 
The other thing I just mentioned uh, in the image that I showed of FSHD and DMD is that the increase in fat replacement varies between muscles and it varies between patients. So this is an example of Melissa Hoymans, who's also one of my former PhD students, where she looked at the different muscles in the lower leg, so in the calf. So we can here see the gastrocnemius lateralis, for instance, where all the black dots are uh, healthy controls which we measured over time. So we measured every patient and health, every healthy control three times. So at baseline uh, at one year and at two years after that. And you can see that all the red dots actually increase uh, in fat fraction over time. This increase, however, differs between the different muscles, right? So we can see that the gastrocnemius lateralis in this boy of about 10 years old is already at 60%. Well, in the same boy, the tibialis posterior muscle, which is still here all the way in the middle is actually still quite low. Uh, but all the muscles seem to show a similar curve. So the imaging DMD group in Florida showed uh, the same thing and showed it earlier than us. So maybe I should have shown it first, uh, is where they specifically looked at two different muscles because they did not use the Dixon technique. They used uh, MR spectroscopy um, and they looked at the soleus. So that's a muscle in the lower leg here at the back and the fascis lateralis, which is a muscle uh, in the upper leg. And here you can also see that in the different age groups, the uh, the number of uh, the, the amount of, of fat increases, right? So these are all the controls in light gray that you can hardly see and DMD baseline and DMD 12 months. So you can see that it increases, but you can also see that in the fascis lateralis, the fat fraction is actually much higher compared to the soleus, which is also something that we see in these images, right? So the upper leg is affected before the lower leg, which is also something that we know clinically. Um, also in other uh, muscular dystrophies, the, the increase in fat replacement varies between muscles and varies between patients. So here uh, uh, in the study by Wang et al, you can see that the fat fraction change, which is on the y-axis, uh, is, is uh, shown for different skeletal muscles of both the upper leg and the lower leg. And you can see that the fat fraction change has quite a high range, right? Some muscles actually decrease in fat fraction and some muscles increase uh, up to 20% or even up to uh, 45%. Uh, sorry, that's not 45% in one year, 4.5%. <laughs> And also in LGMD2I, you can see that the change in fat fraction, so that's, this is a study by Murphy et al, that the change in fat fraction over six years, so this is quite a long study. Um, if you, so this is the zero line uh, at, at zero where there's no change, you can see that pretty much every single muscle, so all the muscles are lined out here on the y-axis, that every single muscle sees an increase in fat fraction over time. And the increases here are quite a bit larger uh, because now the, the, the period that you look at is six years. Um, but you can see that the range between patients is quite large, right? So there's quite a big spread uh, in the measurements. And there's also a, a difference between the different muscles where some muscles seem to go faster compared to others. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's important that for a biomarker, that a biomarker correlates to disease progression, but also correlates to function, right? And here again, I've showed examples in different neuromuscular diseases. Uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of Duchenne in the presentation. That is partly because we study Duchenne a lot, but also because worldwide, there's a lot of attention uh, for this disease. So this again is a study from the, the imaging DMD group uh, where they show that the modified group lower extremity score, so that's a functional scale, uh, correlates or relates to the, to the fastest lateralis fat fraction, where the higher uh, the score, so the worse the function, the, the higher the fat fraction of the fastest lateralis. Also in IBM, this is a study by the group in London, you can see that the, the functional score here on the y-axis correlates negatively with the mean thigh, fraction, uh, mean thigh fat fraction, so they took an average of the whole thigh, uh, that the lower the score, the higher your fat fraction. Also in FSHD, uh, again, the, so sorry, I, I cannot control how people make their figures. So here again, the fat fraction is on the, on the y-axis and the functional score is on the x-axis, where you again see that the lower your score, the higher the fat fraction. Um, so one important step that was made in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy very recently, uh, to, uh, yeah, basically last year, is what I showed here are pure correlations to function, right? So you look at the fat fraction at a certain time and you look at the function at a certain time. 
However, if we want MRI to be used as a biomarker in clinical trials, one of the ideas is that it's actually more sensitive than function at that time. And also that we hope that it can predict future function. So one of the important steps that we made uh, and that many, that several groups at the same time actually made is to try to model these fat fractions. So I already showed in the study with hormones and all that all these muscles seem to show a similar sigmoidal trajectory, right? Where there you see uh, a, a long time, there's hardly any increase. And as soon as a muscle starts to increase its fat fraction, it goes almost linearly, and then it starts to slow down again. So here we looked at the vastus lateralis fat fraction in two different cohorts. So a cohort from Leiden and a cohort from Cincinnati, uh, where all the patients were measured one, two, or three times. And we plotted all their fat fractions against age. And then you can actually model this whole disease trajectory with an S-curve. And then we interviewed these patients uh, to ask them when they lost ambulation. Because the advantage of, of putting all these data on a curve is that you can actually model where their fraction, fat fraction will be in a couple of years. And then you can relate that fat fraction to the moment that they lost ambulation. So we can actually look back in time or look forward in time. The important step that was also made is that in this case, we took age into account into the relation, right? Because if in, in a progressive disease, your and any parameter that increases with age will always correlate with muscle function. In Duchenne, shoe size will correlate with muscle function. And we all know that shoe size will not, is not a very good outcome measure in a clinical trial because it's not very likely to change with therapy. At least I hope it won't. So what we were able to show is that the, the fat that a higher fat fraction at any age, so that means that we took age into account, increases the risk to lose ambulation with a hazard ratio of 1.15, which is, which is a statistical turn. So this means that if you have a higher fat fraction at the age of 10, you have a higher risk of losing ambulation, independent of the effect of age. And imaging DMD, so the, 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 study, the, the group in the US showed at about the same time, a very similar thing where they could also show that the, 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 they plotted it in a different way. So they say the probability of retaining ambulation. So the fact that you keep your ambulation is actually um, increased if you are in a different uh, trajectory of your fat fraction increase, right? So these are the different percentiles of, uh, of the different trajectories. So for us, it was really nice, right? That you actually two groups independently of each other show the same thing, show the fact that a higher fat fraction at any age uh, increases the risk to lose ambulation. So we've all talked, we've talked a lot about fat fraction so far, but in the end, it's not the fat that contracts. Right? It's the skeletal muscle that contracts. So maybe it's actually not so logical to look at the fat, but we should look at, at the muscle which is still there. So if you look at this image, what we do when we analyze these data is actually we draw an RRI around the muscle and we look at the fat fraction of this part of the muscle. So in the dystrophic process, what happens? So of course, this is a very simplified schematic, but in a dystrophic process, you replace part of your muscle by fat. And we look at, so far, we've only looked at the fat fraction, but we have not looked at the area of muscle, which is still there, which actually might, it, it, logically, it maybe gets a much better outcome measure compared to the fat fraction. Right, so several people, of course, also looked at this. I'm sorry for this, this a little bit cluttered table, but you have to look at the muscle volume index here. So this um, column, uh, and there you can see that the muscle contractile volume actually also correlates with function. Right, so it, cor it correlates with the four stair climb, with the six minute walk distance, with the rise from the floor. Uh, so, this is in DD, and also a very recent study uh, in, in late onset pump disease shows the same thing, right? Where the contractile CSA, so the amount of muscle tissue which is still there in uh, controls, but also in, in uh, late onset pump disease patients, actually correlates with muscle strength. So, the larger your muscle, the stronger it is, both for the knee flexors and the knee extensions, uh, the knee extensors. However, one of the things that was also apparent, because there are quite a number of people who did this and in different uh, types of neuromuscular diseases, is that actually the remaining muscle tissue in these patients is not as strong as you would expect 
from a healthy control. So you see here on the x-axis, the amount of muscle tissue which is left. On the y-axis, the amount of force that that muscle can deliver. And you can actually see that with the same amount of muscle or the same cross-sectional area, for instance, at 100 here, the FSHD patients can actually deliver a lot less force, about 2,000 newtons compared to about 5,000 newtons compared to healthy controls. So this was found in FSHD patients. It was also found, we found it, Beatrice Walker found it in, in Duchenne patients, the same thing in the hamstrings. Uh, Luke and et al. from the, the Copenhagen group found the same thing in Becker patients, where actually in Becker patients, it hardly correlated at all, the amount of muscle tissue that you have with muscle torque in this case. Um, and also in, in uh, IBM patients, this was found, right? That with the same amount of muscle tissue, you can actually deliver less force. So in summary for the fat fraction for this part, quantitative MRI can measure the fat replacement of muscle tissue. I hope I've made that quite clear so far. This fat replacement increases with disease progression and or age, because sometimes that is the, the, the same thing, especially in progressive disease. Fat replacement differs both between and within muscles. There are moderate to high correlations to function, so in general above 0.65, although there are also studies that find lower correlations and there are studies that find much higher correlations, but I didn't want, did not want to go into full details here. Uh, and fat fraction can predict loss of emulation, as I at least, as least has been shown in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. However, if you remember the disease cascade that I showed earlier, we're looking at end stage pathology rather than active disease. And that is why all the way at the beginning, when I showed the different contrasts that we could look at, so the edema, the, the, the muscle fiber size, the fibrosis, that is why there's still a lot of active research going on into looking into active disease parameters, right? Because we still don't know whether this end stage pathology measures will in the end be the ones that respond to, to uh, therapy, but we have good hopes. Another thing is that that the quality of the remaining muscle tissue has a is, is lower, right? That's what I showed you in the previous slide. So even if we can stabilize the fat fraction, it's still an hypothesis that patients will also get stronger, right? And the only way to show that is with the therapy that works. So how about trial readiness? We've shown that fat fraction uh, is related to function, is that we can measure it nicely with quantitative MRI, but if you want to perform a trial, it's important that your measure is also accurate and precise and that, that, you, that it's reproducible, right? So the Imaging DMD uh, uh, group did a, a very large, quite one of the largest studies into this, at least the ones that have been, that's been published um, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And what they showed that in a very well QC, so a very well quality controlled system, the reproducibility is high, right? So this is the day-to-day -day variation in uh, uh, lots of, so 29 Duchenne patients and 10 controls where the black bar is day one and day two is the, is the gray bar. And you can see that these measures are actually all quite close together. Uh, they also show that the coefficient of variation is reasonable. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite low. On the other hand, you can also see that there's a difference between the different centers. And what they also showed is that I didn't also did not go into that, but you can measure your fat fraction in two different ways. You can measure the fat fraction using MR spectroscopy, and you can measure the fat fraction using the Dixon sequence. And I've shown a lot of data from the Dixon sequence, but most of the data that I showed from the imaging DMD group were based on MR spectroscopy. But these two measures actually agree uh, quite well, at least in, uh, in Duchenne, right? So here's the line of identity. You can see that the lower uh, fat fractions, the, the MRI-based fat fraction overestimates it a little bit, but in general, um, it agrees quite well. Another important concept that it would be great if you listen to my talk today and you actually you remember this concept is the standardized response mean. So the standardized response mean is the mean change over time divided by the standard deviation between subjects. So you will get a really high standardized response mean if your change over time is quite large, and your variation between subjects is low. If you do not have a large change over time and you have a lot of variability between your subjects, you will find a low standardized response mean. 
And it's generally accepted that uh, if you calculate the standardized, standardized response mean and you have a standardized response mean of higher than 0 0.8, then you have a high level of responsiveness to detect change. So basically what we're looking for is a biomarker with an SRM of higher than 0 0.8. So what was shown in Duchenne, again by the imaging DMD group, is that depending on the muscle that you're looking at, the fat fraction has a standardized response mean of 0 0.6 to 1.82 over one year. And what you can then do with this standardized response mean is actually calculate how many, num how many subjects you need in each group to detect the stabilization of disease progression with 80% power, right? That's depicted here in this table. And what they showed is that if you look at the fastest lateralis fat fraction, for instance, then if you would look across all ages and you would use fastest lateralis fat fraction as an outcome measure, you would only need 13 subjects per group to detect stabilization of disease progression. Or for instance, if you would compare this to the six minute walking test, you would need 68. Right, so MRI would be much more sensitive compared to the six minute walking test to detect this change. Well, you may all have already noticed some other references here. So there are also a lot of other groups who use this uh, methodology to look at their data. Uh, and Murphy et al showed that in LGMD2I, the fat fraction um, had an SRM of 0.53 to 1.28 over six years. So yeah, for part of the muscle that was also higher than 0.8. Well, for function, it, there was a, a, a quite a large variability. And for the CCSA, so the contractile CSA, I mentioned earlier, should we look at the muscle or should we look at the fat? The uh, SRMs were actually all uh, quite a little bit lower. Uh, we recently showed by Nienke van der Velde in, 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 I think it's just appeared in press, that for Becker, uh, also the fat fraction was actually the most sensitive. Uh, outcome measure. So for the fat fraction, the uh, SRMs varied between 0.83 to 0.15 over a two year period. And for function, all these measures were actually lower. Uh, all the SRMs were lower. And also for CCSA, they were all lower than 0 0.8. So I usually don't really like to include quotes in my talk because uh, I like to show images, uh, but I really like this quote from Murphy et al. Um, where they state, if you compare muscle contractile area or fat fraction, that they stated that for every muscle group, the SRM for the CCSA is of smaller magnitude and the p-value less significant than for the respective fat fraction alone, indicating that the variability in the cross-sectional areas within the group outweighs the small yet progressive changes in fat fraction. So as I mentioned earlier, for the SRM, you need an increase over time and small variability between subjects. And because we all, at least this is my interpretation, because we all have different sizes, right? We all have different heights and lengths and the variation, the between subject variation in cross-sectional area is just much larger compared to fat fraction because fat fraction varies between zero and 100, right? So even though conceptually, it would be more logical to look at the remaining muscle tissue, fat fraction is just more sensitive to detect change. So I already mentioned her before, Nienke, I think she's also online. We showed uh, the same thing basically in Becker muscular dystrophy where we performed a stepwise uh, analysis of, of lots of different uh, uh, muscles and lots of different combinations of muscles. And uh, yeah, I won't go through the whole um, stepwise analysis here, but none of the, uh, uh, none of the contractile cross-sectional area measures basically made it to the last step of our stepwise analysis. So we looked at SRM, we looked at uh, correlation with baseline function, but you can read it uh, in the paper. Um, so what are the challenges in, in data analysis mainly? Well, there are proximal distal differences, right? So there are proximal distal differences in Duchenne, also in Becker. I noticed that I forgot to add a label here, but this is in Becker muscular dystrophy. And what do I mean with proximal distal differences? Well, the fat fraction is not homogeneously distributed over a muscle. So this is the peroneal muscle where we see at the bottom, at the distal end, we see a higher fat fraction compared to the middle. And at the top, it's higher again. So you can imagine if you want to measure the fat fraction that you have to be very consistent over time on where you place your slice. Because if you place your analysis slice here on the first measurement and then there on the measurement two years later, you might think that there's an increase in fat fraction, but there was not. So it's the same, maybe even stronger in FSHD, where you look here, if you look at the same muscle 
over different uh, proximal distal areas. So here is the, the distal part of the upper leg, and this is the proximal part of the upper leg, where the distal part here, the, the fossus lateralis is 24%, while at the bottom here, uh, at the pro sorry, at the proximal end, it's only 11%. Also in charcot marie tooth disease, so this is not a quantitative imaging study, but a qualitative imaging study. So please do not look at the arrows because they wanted to point out something else. But you can see here that the fat fraction at the distal end is much higher compared to the proximal end. In Becker muscular dystrophy, if we look at the semitendinosus muscle, it's really quite extreme. Well, here at the proximal end, the semitendinosus muscle is almost completely normal. But at the more distal ends, it's almost completely replaced by fat, right? It's very hard to delineate the, the semitendinosus at that part. So another challenge uh, in fat fraction imaging is the data analysis, right? So far, uh, we've all manually delineated these muscles. So this is an example of uh, lots of different slices and lots of different ROIs of the upper leg. Uh, and this is very time consuming and you really need expert knowledge to do this. There is a high interrate correspondence, but still it's, it's, it's hours and hours and hours. Um, so before going into this much more, I would just like to say that there's the, the solutions are on the way, right? So this is a, a study from the group in Paris where they looked at all different muscular dystrophies. So you can read all the names here. And I explained to you the concept of the SRM earlier. So that's all uh, aligned here on the y-axis. And they used all different, all kinds of different combinations. So they looked at the fastus lateralis, for instance, or the fastus lateral, or the whole quadriceps groups basically uh, delineated separately. And then the whole quadriceps group showed uh, drawn together. And what you can see is that if you look at a muscle group in general, the SRMs are not lower compared to if you would look at a single muscle. So maybe we do not even need to spend all that time in delineating all the different muscles separately. Uh, and Ninka, I come back to the study again, actually showed the same thing, that the fat fraction for the whole thigh, the three center slices, actually performed the best of all the different ROIs that we drew. So we might need to spend all that time. On the other hand, there are also solutions, automatic solutions on the way with semi-automatic segmentation. So there are different approaches out there. There are semi-automatic um, um, segmentations, automatic segmentations, Deep learning assisted. So I'm just showing the tool here from Francesco Santini, uh, the Daphne network, which you can all try out uh, online. It, there's also studies that you, which use DTI as an input. But to, to be honest, this is really not my expertise. So uh, I can recommend this review here where there's an overview of MR image segmentation strategies and you can find everything there. So in summary for the trial readiness, the reproducibility in a very well uh, quality controlled system is quite high. The standardized response means that we mean that we measure are also high. There are proximal distal differences and there's time intensive data analysis. However, solutions for this are on the way. There are still some caveats. So there's a need for specialized MR centers and these specialized MR centers are not necessarily the place where the patients are. So there are different views on this, whether you should train all the centers or move the patients so that, that the jury is still out on that one. Of course, there are contraindications for an MRI. As I explained in the beginning, it's a very big magnet. So a patient with a scoliosis operation will not be able to go uh, into, the into, the, into the scanner. Well, maybe they can go, but I'm not sure what about the data quality. There is the patient burden of an MRI, right? If you only do a fat fracture measurement of a couple of minutes, it's not so high, but if you keep patients in the scanner for half an hour to an hour, it is perceived as a burden. Um, and the data analysis so far is still um, an expert task. So if you look at the future, how do we go from individual studies to an approved outcome measure? Well, I hope you do not think that I'm gonna provide a definite answer here because I can already give you a spoiler alert, alert I will not, uh, but I, <laughs> I will show you where we are. So since I started uh, in this field in, 2007, 2008, there have been a lot of consensus and across stakeholder efforts on the use of MRI in clinical trials. I think it, it's been a, a promising outcome measures, for, a promising outcome measure over the last decade. So one of the first ones that we had was in 2009. I think I was not even in the field back then. Um, there was one in 2017. Then we had another one in 2015 in, in FSHD. Um, there was one in Naarden again. So there is the, the de-risk consortium. So there were a lot of different efforts um, on this. 
Um, but where we are now, I think is what, what is most important is that there are trials, positive trials where MRI is used. So what these, what these consensus efforts have consensus efforts have resulted in is that at least the protocols that are used across these different studies are relatively similar. So the first positive trials are now starting to appear. This is not even now. This is a study from, from Pierre's group out of 2015 in pompous disease, where they showed that in pompous patients that were treated, um, the increase in fat percentage per year was lower in muscles that had a normal muscle T2, so a normal um, inflammation edema measure compared to uh, uh, patients that did not receive enzyme replacement therapy, right? So, but the difference, you can already see the difference is quite small. So you really need to be able to, to measure this correctly. A similar thing was shown in FSHD uh, by the group in Nijmegen, where they gave patients uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and they also gave them uh, physical therapies so or physical training. And there they also showed that the increase in fat fraction was a lot higher in untreated patients compared to patients that receive treatment. And the imaging D&D group again showed the difference between patients that received corticosteroids, so these are the blue bars, compared to patients that did not receive uh, corticosteroids, where the increase in fat fraction over a year, uh, no, over six months, I think, no, this is one year, where the increase over one year was a lot lower in corticosteroid naive patients compared to corticosteroid uh, receiving patients. So. Without going into much detail, there is a difference between the FDA who approves medications in the US and the EMA who does it in, in Europe. So the FDA really explicitly said that they encourage sponsors to consider the use of other biomarkers, such as those measured with magnetic resonance imaging or magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And the position of the EMA seems less explicit, but there are ongoing conversations with the FDA and with the EMA on approving MRI as a biomarker. So very recently, like two or three weeks ago, there were two uh, trials, actually sponsor-initiated trials, that showed a positive response on the MRI. So they did not meet the primary endpoint. So in this case, for the Fulcrum trial in FSHD, the primary endpoint, the change in Dux4 driven gene expression, was not met. However, they did show uh, a decreased muscle fat infiltration uh, and also uh, functional measures. And also very, recent, very recently, it's a pharmaco that also included imaging in their trial. Also, that study also did not met the, the primary endpoint, but they also showed that the, uh, the, the fat fraction actually did not increase um, as much in the, uh, it actually hardly increased at all in the Becker muscular dystrophy patients that re received Givinostat compared to the ones that were on placebo. So in conclusion, quantitative MRI is a promising surrogate outcome measure in clinical trials in neuromuscular diseases because it has a high reproducibility and a high, high sensitivity to detect change uh, and because there's a relation to clinically meaningful events. The very positive thing, at least for me, was that the first positive trials are starting to appear. So there are uh, pharmaceutical companies that take imaging um, into account in their clinical trials. Uh, but to really go further and to go to the FDA uh, and the EMA, we really need involvement of specialized parties, so not just the academics uh, and our sponsors for the next step. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank all of these people, which uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned everybody, uh, and alert you to the Mayo MRI conference, which we will host um, in the fall this year, together with Pierre and together with all Mayo MRI committee, and the abstract deadline of that conference is September 1st. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hermine. Uh, brilliant presentation. I want to remind every, uh, everybody that the summer school webinars are a collaboration between Treat NMD and Euro NMD, which I didn't say at the beginning, as usual. Uh, I, so everybody can unmute yourself and talk if you want. I don't see any questions in Q in Q and A. So to kick start, uh, as usual, uh, I don't know if Pierre has more intelligent questions than me. I'm sure he has. But uh, to kick start, I'm going to ask one. I think that the data analysis of MRI is just lacking a lot of automation, isn't it? Because where when you start uh, 
having pro, uh, possibilities of doing volumetric acquisition and uh, by defining the regions of interest, you can have those same fractions of fat calculated for the whole muscle. But I was a bit uh, disappointed when you said that if you have a slice and you calculate the fraction of fat of a complete thigh that's more sensible to, to, to change that uh, a more uh, a more um, targeted approach because my idea is that basically one of the things that enables uh, diagnosis through MRI in neuromuscular disease is exactly the different patterns of involvement. Would you care to give us some ideas about that, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I would. So I think that, um, I would like to see. So the disappointment, I'm not sure if, if disappointed was the right word, because we were actually quite happy because that might mean that you do not have to delineate every single muscle. So what I think uh, lies behind it is exactly the difference between patients and the difference between the disease stages that they are in. That in some muscles that some patients, that particular muscle is already affected a lot, while in others it is not. So the variability is quite high. And if you lump them all together, then um you might get rid of a little bit of that variation i think to be the most sensitive you would need to decide for each patient what the muscle is that is going to change the most however to relate that muscle then to function is more difficult right so for the vastus lateralis i can imagine that it's related to function because it's an important muscle in the upper leg to relate the only the semitendinosus or only the gracilis to a certain function is, is more difficult. So I think that there's two different ways, right? If you want to relate muscle fat fraction to function, I think it makes sense to lump a lot of muscles together. If you only want to look at which biomarker is the most sensitive to change, then you want to look at a single muscle. But because the EMA and the FDA, and in the end, of course, also the patients, because it makes sense, want to look at function, you you not only want the biomarker to change, you want the function to change. It makes sense to lump them together. That's clear. Pierre, do you have any comments or? Uh, yes, well, uh, do you hear me well? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot, uh, Herman, for this uh, excellent uh, webinar. I think you have covered uh, uh, what is really important for uh, clinician colleagues and uh, uh, the point you you alluded to uh, antonio i think it's a critical one because um what you said is, is just what we told um because the fact that the, a global a global analysis might beat uh what we could say the, the preferred muscle uh, is totally contraintuitive uh, the, and the, the first thing is that um we are not dealing with diagnosis, so patterns is not is not a question here. And uh, I, I think, as uh, Herman said, um, making a global analysis. I mean, we we also suppress uh, a lot of small variations that we induced and that can impact on the, on the so-called standardized response mean. So. Uh, I hope that uh, this concept of going global for, for clinical study will probably uh, uh, impose itself in the future because it, it will greatly simplify things. Uh, and uh, even though we are pushing that uh, uh, for the sake of honesty, I have to say that the idea, uh, I think first what pushed forward by uh, the Maasai group and then it was taken over by, by Newcastle, uh, and it's Herman Rangoat who, who very patiently look at uh, many diseases and came to the conclusion that the global SRM is, is, is very important. Um, I, I just I, I, I have a question, um, and and, uh, and it's really the challenge for me. Uh, we need to convince the uh, regulatory agencies, and I think that we we have a, a, a large body of evidence showing that. Well, muscle destruction for dystrophy and, and also for other, other disease uh, precedes uh, the change in uh, function and the, the clinical symptoms. This, I think, really a, a, a body of evidence for that. Now, if, we, if, if I want to play the devil advocate, uh, uh, we need to prove that when we stop the muscle destruction, as we can show it with imaging and, and there the are more and more cases, well, it is not obvious and it is not systematic that uh, it, it will announce and it, it really predicts 
uh, 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 lower less uh, uh, protection of function and a delay in the symptoms. Uh, it, I, th I think it's impossible to, from, from the natural history to affirm that. And uh, I don't know what is your position. I, I'm, I'm rather pessimistic about that because if the regulatory agency really want to know that, it will mean that we need many years to uh, start from these ongoing studies showing that, well, the muscle destruction is prevented to some extent to the point that the, the clinical symptoms are delayed or improved. Uh, if we follow the natural history, it will take many years and it will be a pity for the patient. Yep. No, I fully agree. And but what my understanding is, but I, I have not talked to the to the EMA about this yet, but what I hear um, is that the EMA is willing to accept uh, MRI as an outcome measure if all the other measurements also turn into go into the same direction right so even if the functional outcome measure does not reach significance but it shows an improvement and mri shows significance then they will accept it as an outcome measure but we still need i i fully agree i think based on natural history i'm not sure if that's going to happen you need a positive trial and you need a good drug and I'm an MRI person, so I will not make the drugs. <laughs> so we need good people to make these drugs. <laughs> and, and I see it as our role and my role to at least convince the sponsors that we think that this measure can be measured well, reproducible uh, in a good way, and that they will include MRI into their trials. And then indeed, we need to wait until a sponsor makes a medicine, makes, yeah, it makes a therapy where it's actually shown that it works and that you, if you would have used the MRI rather than the functional test as a primary outcome, you would have needed half of the patients. And I hope that will not take five years, but I don't know. So um, I wanted to ask you about FSHD. Uh, if you don't mind. So it's that kind of disease where the MRI uh, is abnormal before the function is affected. Mm -hmm. And you, you have early signs of inflammation before you have atrophy. Uh, so my question is to all sides. Before we see inflammation, do you, do you know of any other way of predicting that that muscle will be affected? And do you think that the, the window between seeing inflammation and going downwards to atrophy if, is enough for us to, to plan any intervention in that space or not? <laughs> That's a, a challenging one. Um, I would say that in FSHD, so I, if, I, if I remember the fulcrum file correctly, they focused, I think, also on muscles which had intermediate fat fraction. I'm not sure if they also focused on the muscles that had stir uh, abnormalities. But you're basically asking if there's something that predicts that pre, that that appears prior to the stir abnormalities, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, so I I don't know. I don't know. I only what I know of the studies from from the Copenhagen group is that they mainly looked whether the stir abnormalities indeed always increase to uh, lead to fat replacement, which is also not very. It's not a very straightforward relation. Um, I only know that 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 well. Pierre does the same and we do the same. We're always looking for other measures to look at those active muscles. And I'm not sure whether that will be uh, metabolism. So we've looked a lot at, at phosphorus metabolism. I know that the group in Basel is also looking at phase contrast MRI, so looking at, at, uh, at functional measures. I think it's, it's just a matter of keeping on developing these things and, and, and trying them in patients to see, because yeah, I, I wish I could give you a better answer, but I don't know. Thank you. It's a good enough one. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. don't know if Sani has anything. I don't know if everybody can talk, but I don't know if Sani has anything too. I know that she's on, at least her picture is online. Yes, she is. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, we are still uh, investigating it, but uh, that, that, that's our hope that uh, maybe functional measures could come before, but I, I, I cannot, uh, unfortunately, I cannot give it. Uh, I confident answer yet. Thank you. <laughs> okay, any more questions? I don't see questions in Q&A. So we are about uh, at the end. So I would like very much uh, to thank you, Ermin, for this splendid uh, um, uh, 
uh, exposition presentation and I think that it has lots of uh, lessons to learn and that will discuss uh, will incite discussions and progression and I hope that everybody who attended today or will attend in the future in the form of on-demand webinar will be able to to get ideas from here to make uh, progress in research and and for the profit of our patients of course okay so thank you very much and yeah, hope to you. talk soon okay. bye now. bye bye bye